Hospital information. No, sir, I can't ring Mr. Boyd's room. No, they operated on him this morning. Yes, an appen, an append, an appen. Yes, they took it out. Well, Sally, if you're not busy tonight, how about you and me grabbing a quick sandwich and catching the early show at a movie? Excuse me. Blair, you know. Oh, hello, Irene. Sure, I had a grand time last night. I was out with Mr. Gustakis in the Pittsburgh. First to a classy cocktail bar, and then dinner at a hotel where the soup was two dollars a plate. And then to a nightclub with real champagne. Uh, well, goodbye. See you later. Uh, what were you saying about tonight, Joe? Oh, I, uh, nothing. Nothing at all. I... Good morning, Dr. Lane. Morning. Oh, hi, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, uh, has Nurse Mary Lamont checked in yet? Yes, ten minutes ago. Oh, thank you. You know, I got half the notion to take a good poke at that guy trying to cut in on Doc Kildare's girl. Control yourself, muscle-bound. If your pal Kildare don't do anything about it, why should you stick your nose in? What's she giving him a tubble for, anyhow? Why not? The way I see it, there are only two things she can do. Jump off a bridge over Jimmy Kildare or go out with this guy, in spite of the fact that he's single, rich, and good-looking. Yeah, he'll need his dough. Up in brain surgery, they're commencing to call him the Undertaker's friend. Oh. Emergency? Yes, Nurse Lamont? Dr. Kildare? Yes, he went past the desk, but I don't remember if he was coming or going out. Thank you, Sally. Is Dr. Kildare in? Dr. Kildare is in Dr. Gillespie's office. And everything is okay. Gillespie shut himself up in the other room. Thanks. I get an hour off today. How about having lunch? Jimmy, that'll be wonderful. Hilda! Uh, yes, Dr. Gillespie. Which is, uh, I have to make a phone call first. Hilda! Jimmy, Hilda! Coming, Dr. Gillespie. Mary, you have another date for lunch, haven't you? If you already have a date, then you mustn't break it. Besides, I, I'm not sure Dr. Gillespie will let me off. But, Jimmy, you know... Dr. Hilda! Can't you hear me? I'll be right there, Dr. Gillespie. No lunch, Mary. Gildare? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Jimmy, you've had a pretty busy morning. Why don't you... Well, what did you want, sir? You were saying something was ridiculous. Ah, this report on Rufus Ingersoll. Jimmy, Rufus Ingersoll's been examined by every department in this hand-painted institution. Here are 27 different reports by 27 different doctors without a mistake in one of them. Why, it's impossible. Parker? Parker! Uh, Mr. Rufus Ingersoll should be treated with kindness, sweetness, and light. Will you kindly send in Mr. Rufus Ingersoll? Yes, sir. Uh, let me handle this, Jimmy. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, well, Mr. Ingersoll, good morning. And how are you feeling today? Never felt better in my life. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Because your system's in a state of collapse. Sit down before you fall down. Mr. Ingersoll, you're suffering from a bad case of what we might call the dangerous age. You've been living too young. You've been eating too young. You've been drinking too young. 
You've been, yes, you've been thinking too young. And all because you fancy yourself to be in love with a young girl in her 20s. And what's the result? Your stomach is overworked, your heart is overstrained, and your kidneys look like the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, my age has nothing to do with it. I'm still a young man. Yeah, young enough to make a fool of yourself. Dr. Gillespie, I came here for medical advice. Okay, you take a large dose of common sense. Of course, your personal affairs have got nothing to do with me, but medically speaking, my advice is that you should lead the life of a gentleman of 50 with his wife and children. Otherwise, Mr. Ingersoll, one of these fine days, you're going to drop dead. Good day, Mr. Ingersoll. This way, sir. Next patient! Next patient! Well, how can I examine you with your uniform on? Examine me? I don't understand. Well, I call for the next patient, and you pop in. You must be the next patient. Have you forgotten Mr. Grayson's waiting in the next room? Why, in the name of common sense, didn't you tell me? Because you told me. Well, no, just shake a leg. Yes, Doctor. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell Grayson we'll be in right away. Yes, Doctor. Say, so what's your opinion on Grayson? You think he's going blind? Mm -hmm. Case history shows an increasing pressure on the optic nerve. Every indication points to an enlarged pituitary gland. Oh, it agrees with my diagnosis. What do you prescribe? An operation. Removal of the tumor. The sooner the better. You positive of that? Yes. Well, it's the only chance he has outside of a miracle. You're absolutely right. But the final decision to operate is up to the surgeon. Well, that's one thing we can do for Grayson. Get him a good man. Hmm. Means you have an idea. I wouldn't dare suggest it to anyone but you, Dr. Gregory Lane. Gregory Lane? Yes. I know there's been some talk. He lost several patients in a row. But people don't realize that sometimes patients die because there's no chance of recovery. What are you trying to prove? Well, I'm not trying to prove anything. But I feel positive that Lane's a fine surgeon and that the medical profession needs him. Well, what brought Dr. Gregory Lane to your eagle eye? Well, didn't you once tell me he was the most promising young surgeon ever came to this hospital? Oh, well, I did say he had a fine pair of hands, but his judgments worried me lately. Well, there's one sure way to check on his judgment. Oh. Well, see what he says about Grayson. Aren't you always telling me that anyone who agrees with you is a darn good doctor? <laughs> Ah, you're getting too smart for me. Go on, get in there. Good morning, Mr. Grayson. Well. Mr. Grayson, uh... It's as bad as I thought, isn't it? Mr. Grayson, our advice is an operation. A very delicate operation. I understand. I insist on the operation. You see, I... I'm not afraid of anything except going blind. We're going to send you to one of our very best brain surgeons. Will you tell Dr. Lane I'll talk to him after he's examined, Mr. Grayson? I'm very grateful to you both. Never mind us, Mr. Grayson. We'd be pretty bad doctors if we didn't do everything humanly possible for you. I know that. But we both know that the final power of life and death is still in the hands of the great healer. Yes, Mr. Grayson, that doesn't change. Dr. Carew is on the phone, sir. Thank you. Well, good luck, Mr. Grayson. Thank you, Doctor. Hello, Carew. Well, how is the head of this gold-plated palace today? Oh, oh, I'm fine, Leonard. Mr. Paul Messenger just phoned. You're doing vagal kill there out to the Institute this afternoon. Dr. Squires will show him the place and offer him the job. Have you said anything to Kildare about it yet? No, not a word. But in justice to everybody, I'm going to do my best to make him accept. That's more than generous, Leonard. If you lose him, I know it'll be an awful blow to you. Blow? It'll be an earthquake. Well, since you're not going to take your hour off, am I right? And I want to talk to you anyway. Let's go and dig our graves a little deeper with our teeth. Miss Parker? 
Lunch. Drat that Molly bird. If I don't drink at least one glass of milk a day, she hides my cigarettes. Yeah. I know it's good for me, but oh, I hate this stuff. Yeah. What made you hesitate about Grayson, Jimmy? For a moment, I wasn't sure. What made you decide? It was my best thought on the subject. That's the one most important thing for a doctor to know. To face situations with nothing to lean on but what he's learned. Yes, even in my short experience, there have been times when my blood ran cold. And yet you had to act like the Almighty. With life in one hand and death in the other. You had to do it and you did. That's what I call being a born doctor. Couldn't have learned that from you, could I? Mm -hmm. Aren't you uh, going to drink your milk? Oh, sure, 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 sure. But don't try and change the subject on me. Jimmy, you will make mistakes, but let them be your mistakes. Use your eyes, your heart, your brain, your instinct. Make up your mind. And then go ahead. Do you think I'll ever learn half what you know? Yeah. Because you'll have to begin where I leave off. And do you think you're being fair to me? To yourself? To the medical profession? Well, what do you mean? You haven't seen Dr. Lockberg in two months. Why? Because I'm a good doctor. And I know what's the matter with me. Cancer isn't necessarily hopeless. Well, every time I intend to call Lockburg up, something important turns up. Nothing is that important. Look, if I'm to finish any part of what you've started, you'll have to stay here and teach me as long as you can. All right, Jimmy. I'll call him this afternoon to come over. Well, I already told him to be here at 5 o'clock. Why, you in... Come on, come on, drink your milk. Things people do for the sake of their health. Don't think you can hide from me, Dr. James Kildare. Now look here, Molly Bird. This is my bedroom, and even the superintendent of nurses hasn't got any right to come barging oh, in here. be quiet. Dr. Kildare, Nurse Morgan informs me that you supplied patient 1124 with a new suit of clothes from the hospital emergency fund. Oh, yes, I did. But you see, Miss Bird... I see everything. You had his own suit burned. Well, I ordered that suit burned as a public precaution. Oh, public precaution, my foot. Well, the man had nothing more contagious than a broken arm. I personally examined that suit of clothes and found definite traces of leprosy. Leprosy? Leprosy. Bubonic plague, housemaid's knee, and a slight trace of Scandinavian hookworm. Scandinavian hookworm, you fool. Besides, Molly, there was a job waiting for him if he had a good suit of clothes. Lenny Gillespie, you haven't drunk your milk. Molly, no matter what else you can say about me, I'm a man of honor. I said I'd drink one glass of milk, and one glass of milk I drank. Give me my cigarettes, please. Then how is it the bottle still full? <laughs> You'll drink this glass of milk or no cigarettes today. Yeah. Now give me my cigarettes. Well, they're still in your pocket. I forgot to take them out this morning. What friends? Well, you've been trying for 25 years to force somebody to take care of himself. <laughs> it's a little hard to break the habit. Well, if you can get along without me for a while, supposing I run up and have a talk with Dr. Lane. Yes, Grayson's in pretty bad shape. Let me know when Lane wants to talk to me. Well, that's what I meant to do. And later in the afternoon, we're going for a drive in the country. Well, now you're beginning to act sensibly, sir. It'll do you a world of good. Uh, maybe. I've ordered a nice big car, so the three of us will be comfortable. Three of us? Uh-huh. You and me and Nurse Mary Lamont. Yeah, well, why not Mary Lamont? She isn't engaged to Dr. Lane, even though she did go out with him last week. 
What are you expected to do? Die an old maid because you only get $20 a month? I don't expect her to do anything of the sort. Well, Dr. Gillespie, I guess it's pretty obvious to you how I feel about Mary Lamont, but I can't and I won't say anything to her about it. After all, $20 a month is $20 a month. We're ready, Dr. Lane. Good, let's go then. I want to see you after this operation. Dr. Lane, a package arrived for me this morning. It contained a dozen pair of beautiful silk stockings. Silk stockings? Silk stockings. I'd send them back except for three things. I don't know where they came from. I can't prove you sent them. And <laughs> besides, they're awfully pretty. I don't know a thing. But I'll admit anything if you'll have dinner with me tonight. All right, Greg. <laughs> we'll celebrate a successful operation. I need a successful operation. Oh, it's only the fools who are talking. Anyone knows mortality and brain surgery is high. Yeah, but you can't explain that to a dead patient. Dr. Gillespie still believes in you. You're operating on his patient, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I still believe in myself, Mary. But this time I've got to... We've got an operation to do. Come on, Nurse Lamont. How are you feeling, Mr. Grayson? Sleepy. That's from your shot in the arm. I'm going to do my best to fix you up as good as new. Oxygen. Adrenaline. Hurry. Never mind the adrenaline. Jimmy, do you have a cigarette? Oh, Mary. Please, Jimmy, give me a cigarette. All right. By the way, Dr. Gillespie wants you and me to... Uh... Thanks, Mary. Dr. Lane, I was in the gallery and I... The operation was a success, but the patient died. off the assembly line this morning. 41 brand new lives. Sort of evens things up, doesn't it? You mean about life and death? Mm. I didn't think about it that way. I just happened to come here. Well, your instincts were right. It's the best place you could have come to. This is what it's really all about. Jimmy, Dr. Lane did everything he could. No one could have done any more, could he? No one. You see, Mary, I prescribed an operation. Lane agreed and performed it. We both knew how, how slim the chances were. But that's our job, and it's one of the hardest things we have to learn. I haven't learned it yet. Well, neither have I. Mmm, that's what people need. Pure, sweet air to fill your lungs with. And open up your pores to the sunshine. A 
What's the matter with you, Mary? You look as if you hadn't opened a paw for months. I did surgery today under Dr. Lane. Now, oh, Mary, that patient had one chance in a hundred of living through the operation. One chance in a million of living without it. You're absolutely right. I reported that fact to Carew, too. What did Dr. Carew say? Well, what could he say? Too many people dying. Dr. Gillespie, Greg needs help. Dr. Lane, I mean. You're right, Mary. Something ought to be done about it. Isn't anybody interested in where we're going? We're going to the Messenger Institute at the university. Who told you? It wasn't me, Dr. Gillespie. I suppose you told him why, too. No, sir. I didn't know that. Well, then I'll tell you. We're going to the Messenger Institute for Medical Research because I've got business there. And I'm taking you two along for the ride. Of Mr. Messenger's open-handed generosity, this building with its magnificent equipment is a shining example. Now, listen, Egghead. Uh, the eminent and imposing Dr. Squires was known as Egghead in medical school, for reasons you're both too young to know. Leonard, I once busted you in the snoop for that, and I'm just the guy who can do it again. Now, listen here, Squires. We all know this is the finest institute in America, but come to the point. <laughs> Very well. The point is, I have a job for Dr. Kildare. Job for me? Well, if it hadn't been yeah. for me, it'd taken him two hours to tell you that. Dr. Gildare, Mr. Messenger feels that he owes to you his daughter's sanity. Perhaps her life. Yours was a remarkable instance of correct diagnosis and treatment. I congratulate you. Well, I'll tell him the job pays $500 a month. $500 a month? And you'll have a free hand here to pursue whatever research you choose. And if you tend to your knitting, and when you're an old married man, you'll inherit Egghead's job, 20,000 bucks a year. And that ain't hay. Well, why don't you say something? Don't stand there like a bump on a log. Uh, well, it's, it's the sort of thing you dream about. I, uh, Dr. Gillespie, you knew all about this? That means you want me to take it? Do I want him to take it? You hear that, Egghead? I, these youngsters are hard to please. You show them the house that goes with the job. House? Oh, yes. <laughs> Shall we go see it? I've ordered some tea. <laughs> tea? <laughs> when I first knew him, he thought clean shirts were effeminate. <laughs> now he drinks tea. <laughs> it's Mr. Messenger's idea that a man does his best work when his home surroundings are ideal. Thank you, George. You uh, think you could be happy here, Dr. Kildare? Happy? Well, he'd be crazy if he couldn't. Well, you show around, Jimmy. It's your party, you know. I feel a little tired. I think I'll stay here and have a spot of tea with Dr. Squires. Maybe a crumpet or two. Well, Egghead, how am I doing? If I hadn't known differently, I'd have thought you really wanted him to take the job. This is the greatest opportunity Jimmy will ever have in his life. And if he takes it, all I've planned will come tumbling down around my ears. <laughs> all jokes aside, Leonard, won't you have a cup of tea? Uh, suppose I get you a glass of milk. Milk? Yeah. I'm so full of milk now, I'd be afraid to meet a cat. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> this isn't true. This sort of thing doesn't happen. But it is true. You have everything in the world ahead of you. I wonder. Dr. Gillespie wants you to take it, doesn't he? Does he? He even bragged about the salary. You remember that. Well, right now, I'm not thinking about the money. But you must think about it. It's your future, your whole life. Who was it wanted you to see this house? It was Dr. Gillespie, wasn't it? Yes, Mary. He even talked about the future. That's what he said. I wish I knew what he was thinking. Well, shall we look at the living room? Mary, you have dinner with me tonight. I've got a date. I'll get out of it, Jimmy. Hey, break it up, you two. Uh, Dr. Kildare, I think we'll be ready for you to move in, say, uh, next Monday. You're very kind, Dr. Squires, and Mr. Messenger's generosity is tremendous, but... Uh, 
I'm afraid I'll have to think it over and let you know. Oh, of course, Dr. Kildare. Think it over. Uh, will you have a cup of tea? Uh, say, Egghead, I think I'll take that milk now. Good evening, Dr. Kildare. You're her sight for sore eyes, and why shouldn't you be? Short beer, Mike. Yes, sir. -y. Sure, and what more pleasant sight could there be than a fine young son of the old two suit and his own teeth stepping up to buy himself a good drink? How are you, Joe? Oh, good evening, Doc. It'll be 30 bucks any way you figure it. A joint that gets two dollars for soup has got to get more than a nickel for a cup of coffee. Say, I got it. When we get to the Golden Slipper, I just won't eat anything. That'll give me a dollar sixty margin. Golden Slipper? Well, even if you don't eat, the cover charge there is five dollars a head. Huh? Five dollars a head? Even for not eating? Oh, boys, there must be some way out of this. Joe, my boy, maybe I can help you. There's a drink I can mix that'll solve all your troubles. If you can only coax the lady in to sample it. Ah, wait a minute, Mike. Now, Dr. Kildare, I'm referring to a humble little concoction known as the Kiss of Kilkenny. It don't make you drunk, and it don't make you dizzy. It leaves you with one consuming thought in your mind, to sit quiet in your chair and listen to the angels sing. Will it keep a lady sitting here all evening? My friend, back in County Donegal, I personally concocted one for a giddy young thing who wanted to be took to a dance. How long did it keep her quiet, Mike? Well, sir, that was 13 years ago come Shrove Tuesday. And according to a letter I received last week, she's still sitting there. <laughs> Say, I know this gal of mine. You fix up two drinks for her, and I'll be back here in a jiffy with her. <laughs> what do you advise for dinner, Mike? Well, I can fix you a steak as fresh as a new policeman. Two steaks medium rare. Coming up. Two steaks medium rare for Dr. Kildare. Give him the two we're saving for the boss. Hello, Mary. Am I late, Jimmy? No. Sit down. I've already ordered the steaks. Are you hungry? Dog, good. Mary, did I ever tell you what my mother said to me when I left for New York? Several things. Which one? Well, she said you will never get anywhere trying to be anybody but Jimmy Kildare. Jimmy Kildare is all right with me. <sighs> Over the past hour, I've been trying to be someone else. Why, Jimmy? Because... If I were someone else, maybe I'd have brains enough to say this in a different way. Say it your own way. I'm not going to take the job at the Messenger Institute. Miss Lamont, report to Superintendent Bird's office right away. Tony. If we had a patient in this hospital as weak as your coffee, we'd give him a blood transfusion and send for his relatives. I don't blame the nurses for squawking. Nurses are just like husbands. You can abuse them, insult them, work them to death, jump all over them, they'll take it. But give them a bad cup of coffee and you've got a revolution on your hands. Oh, come in, Mary. I'll be down at the kitchen in ten minutes and show you how to make coffee. You sent for me, Miss Bird? Lamont, I'm promoting you to staff surgical nurse permanently. Wait a minute. It's not that big an honor. I'm sorry, Miss Bird. Of course, you'll have to be more careful about our rules. For instance, I know that you accepted some silk stockings for a member of our staff. I'm sorry. I'll send them back. Hmm. Before okaying this promotion, I must know that you plan on staying with this institution. I guess I'll be here forever. Because I certainly would not give this chance to a girl who's liable to quit her job to get married or something. I'm not figuring on getting married. No. No, child. I don't know why I'm so silly. Well, I know. I wormed it out of Dr. Gillespie about Jimmy Kildare and the Messenger Institute. And this can only mean that he didn't decide the way you wanted him to. I kept hoping against hope. The only man in the world? It's not true, Mary. It's never true. If it were, nine out of ten women in this world would never get married. 
And we women can be thankful that fate fixed it that way. Because so many times, so pitifully many times, Cinderella can't have her prince. And if there were no other man in the world for her, how would the Cinderellas end up? Like me, Mary. I'm 49 years old, and what have I got in life? Bad coffee. <laughs> no, Mary. Give any woman a decent husband with a clean shave and a pretty good chance of getting on in this world, and she'll come so close to thinking it's love that she'll fool him and herself. I never thought about it like that. Well, try thinking that way. And stop eating your heart out. Now get out of the mouth and get to bed. Report to surgery at 9 a.m. Good night. I said good night. Good night, Miss Bird. Mary. Don't send back those stockings. I can't. I have one pair on. Oh. <coughs> Hello. Superintendent Bird speaking. Beginning tomorrow morning, Nurse Mary Lamont starts a staff surgical nurse. Salary increase accordingly. She's to be assigned to Dr. Gregory Lane. If it's you, Nosey Parker, I'm taking a bath. If it's you, Molly Bird, I, I'm not smoking a cigarette. Anyone else can go shoot themselves. Me. Now, what do you mean, barging in here at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning? What do you think this is, a six-day bicycle race? Well, it's only a quarter after 10. What do, you, what do you want in the middle of the night? I'm not going to take the messenger job. Why, you unmitigated young upstart. Do you realize, Jimmy, you'll never have another opportunity like that as long as you live? I'm staying here because I, I'm selfish. Ever since I was a kid, I've known I wanted to be some kind of a doctor, but I didn't know what or where. Now I do know. I want to be a diagnostician, and you're the only one that can teach me. Jimmy, I'm the happiest guy in the city. As a matter of fact, I've been sitting right here since 6 o'clock, waiting for you to come in to tell me your decision. <laughs> I'm sorry, I... Been a little busy. Yeah, none too pleasantly, uh, maybe, you know. Well, uh, you know. Oh, uh, I've got a note from Carew's office. Seems I'm behind in my surgery, and they want me to catch up right away. Uh, do you mind if I borrow the... No, uh, don't take anything you want, Jimmy. Yes, yeah, he's been raising chains with me about that, too. Yes, I'm to start tomorrow morning, assisting Dr. Lane. Well, perhaps I could arrange to have you transfer to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, thanks. Say, what's the matter with this fellow Lane, anyway? I've heard he inherited a lot of money, and yet he wants to stick around this skating rink. No, no, that's not true. He's had money all his life, but he happens to want to be a surgeon. Oh, he also happens to be interested in Mary Lamont. Or I'll fire three or four of my pet studios. Isn't that Mary Lamont's business? You have no regrets about that, Jimmy? <clears throat> Dr. Gillespie, if I've told you once, I've told you five times that Mary Lamont... All right, all right, all right. Don't bite my head off. Furthermore, Dr. Gillespie, it's past your bedtime. All right, Papa. I'll go to bed like a good boy. And I'll be kind to dumb animals, and I'll wash behind the ears. So who do you think you are, Molly Bird in long pants? Blair General Hospital emergency. Just a minute. Hello, Irene. As I was saying, last night, Joe Wayman and me starred. Me and that new blue chiffon, and Joe, mind you, he's actually in a tuxedo. When all of a sudden I find I'm paralyzed from the waist down. No, I didn't touch a drop. Just one little glass of Irish lemonade in Mike Ryan's place. But was Joe Wayman nice? He never said one word about me spoiling his evening. Not the accident, emergency. Emergency, one coming up. Funny thing, no identification. Nothing but a key and a $5 bill. Did you go through all his pockets? What pockets? All he had on was an overcoat over some pajamas and a pair of pants. You know, Sally, I got it all figured out what was the matter with you last night. It was something you drank the night before with that guy from Pittsburgh. I'll bet it was. But, gee, Joe, you were so sweet. Carrying me home and singing like an angel all the way. This is surgery B. One coming up? Okay. There's a case coming up from emergency. Good morning, Doctor. 
Oh, good morning, Doctor. I'm assisting you. I have some surgery to catch up on. Well, I'm glad to have you. I um, had some pretty unkind thoughts about you last night, Kildare. Last night? Yes, I had a date with a very pretty girl for dinner right up till dinner time. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Maybe you are, but I still had dinner alone. Well, it's nice having you around. I can keep my eye on you. Here's the x-ray, Doctor. Increasing intracranial pressure, pulse slowing, temperature rising. We'll, uh, we'll have to operate to save his life. I'll get him set. What day is this? What day is this? Wednesday. Wednesday? Good. I thought for a moment I'd missed it. Missed what? Friday. Friday at noon. I've got to... Now, look, you have a head injury. A skull fracture, and I'm afraid we'll have to operate. Operate? What's this for? It's to help you rest, to quiet your nerves. How bad is my head? Why don't you just put yourself in our hands? We'll do everything that possibly can be done. You mean I might die? With an immediate operation, you have a very good chance of pulling through. Won't be operated on. I've got to get out of oh, If you get up now, you may not live to reach the street. That's five years of dying. I won't be operated on. Oh, you want to live, don't you? No, oh, if I couldn't die now, I've got to live till Friday. What about Friday? Who are you? What's your name? Perhaps we can help. How could you tell? Tell him to get ready. Wait a minute. Maybe we'd better put him under observation for a couple of days. What? Why, he needs an immediate operation and you know it. No, I don't. I'm not sure. How can I be sure when Grayson and the others... I don't know what to do, Kildare. Do what your own judgment told you to do in the first place. Operate. But my judgment's been wrong. Not in Dr. Gillespie's opinion. Dr. Gillespie. Yes, he thinks you're a fine surgeon. Says you have the best hands in the hospital. He said something else, too. He said there are times when we have to act with life in one hand and death in the other. And that the true test of a doctor is his faith in his own judgment, even though he knows someone's going to die if he's wrong. We'll operate immediately. This patient has refused the operation, but I take full responsibility. That's it. Take him away. How's the pressure? Fine. I don't think I could have done that without those words you said. Oh, you did a fine job, Doctor. Thanks. As far as I'm concerned, everything's going to be all right, I think, from now on. Oh, I'm sure it is. It's a long session. Well, it's time for lunch. I'm on office call this afternoon. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, please, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. It was a beautiful operation, Doctor. Maybe now we'll have something to celebrate. Let's. Tonight? All right. Swell. Dr. Gildare. Yes, Dr. Crew. I'm very pleased you decided to remain with us. Why no, no, no explanations are necessary. I understand. Uh, where's Dr. Lane? Oh, he's just left for lunch. If you'd been there, you'd have seen the kind of brain surgery you read about. Is that so? Well, I trust you're right. Uh, doctor, because of these somewhat unusual circumstances, I'd like to have your personal report on this case. Well, Dr. Lane has office duty, so naturally I'll be watching it. Very good. He's coming out of it now. Breathing easily and naturally. Mm-hmm. Thursday. Thursday? Not Friday. No, it's Thursday. 
You've put me in the wrong day. The wrong day of the week. Easy there. It's the wrong day. Friday's the day I was. Well, tomorrow will be Friday. You can't trick me. It'll always be Thursday. You've locked me up in the wrong day of the week. Careful now. You've got to break through. You've got to break through to Friday. Get me a hypo of morphine and a restraining sheet quickly. There isn't the time to break through yet. I'll tell you when the right time comes. You'll tell me? Yes, I promise. We'll start planning right now. If you lie still and help save your strength. Who are they? Oh, they're going to help us plan. And I'd better give you this. You'll need all the strength you can get. Close your eyes. Get that restraining sheet on him quickly. Doctor. What's wrong? Uh, there's some mental disturbance. I had to give him a hypo. Couldn't it be the effect of the anesthetic? I'm afraid there's no doubt. His mind's gone. But if you hadn't operated, he'd be dead now. His brain's dead. What good if the rest of him's alive? You were there, Kildare. You saw everything. I didn't make a single mistake, did I? Not one. Well, and how's the patient? Why, that's a restraining sheet. Yes, I thought it was wise. The patient showed signs of becoming violent. Violent? Dr. Lane, what is this? Do you mean to say that your patient has lost his mind? Apparently. Apparently. Dr. Lane wasn't here when the patient recovered consciousness. But you had the patient restrained. Because, in your opinion, he's now deranged. Yes. I see. Dr. Lane, remove your patient to a private room. It's the least we can do. Then I'll see you in my office. Dr. Carew, you'll want me there, too, won't you? No, this is Dr. Lane's responsibility only. Oh, nevertheless, I'd like to be there. Don't stick your neck out, Kildare. It's my neck. Dr. Lane, I freely concede that a doctor constantly has to make decisions, to operate or not to operate. But also, he must be right when he makes those decisions. Otherwise, we... Wait a minute! I'm in on this. What have I missed? I just left your patient. He's as mad as a March hare. What were you saying, Carew? The Dr. Lane has made one too many mistakes. Dr. Gillespie, I was just saying that in this last case, I urged Dr. Lane to operate. I hesitated a moment, but the decision to operate was my own. Well, then why is Kildare on the carpet? He isn't. He insisted on being present. Look, let me settle this thing once and for all. I decided to operate, and in a similar case, I'd do it again. Good. Now we know where we stand. Right. Dr. Lane, errors of judgment are difficult to prove. But in this case, you also performed the operation without the patient's permission, violating his legal right. His legal right to die? If you please, Dr. Kildare. You, Dr. Lane, have placed this institution in a very serious position. You're suspended from duty pending a hearing before the hospital board tomorrow, Friday at noon. I'm sorry. You may go. Dr. Carew, I'd like your permission to testify that board meeting. I can't permit that. And how could you possibly help Dr. Lane? Well, I don't know. No. He don't know. He wants to prove the operation didn't make the patient insane, but he don't know how to do it. Come on, Jimmy. Let's... Now, wait a minute. Suppose the man was uh, insane before the operation. Suppose, for instance, he was suffering from schizophrenia. Oh, 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 poppycock. I don't think the hospital board would be interested in your theories. Your request is denied. But uh, after he came out of the anesthetic, he spoke incoherently of Friday. And before the operation, he made it very plain that Friday was more important to him than living. Now he's a psychiatrist. If you concern yourself further in this case, neither of us can save you from the unpleasant medical and criminal consequences. Gilday, you seem to forget one thing. Dr. Lane went ahead after the patient had refused the operation. But if the man was insane, he had no legal right to refuse the operation which left the decision up to the doctor. Now, he's a lawyer. I consider the matter settled, Dr. Kildare. Which is the way a high-class gentleman says, get out of my office and mind your own business. Come on, Jack. Can you get along without me for the rest of the day? Oh, I guess so. It might be a good idea. Go on out and take in a show. Forget all about this little difficulty. No, I don't think it's so little. Maybe I haven't been here long enough to get the hospital viewpoint, but if Lane's kicked out, it'll look as though he murdered those patients. And we know he didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you going back to your office? No, I'm not. Get your hands off my chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe I'm going to make a fool of myself. I don't doubt that, but how? 
I'm going to find out who this mysterious man is so that I can prove he was mentally deranged before Lane operated. No, he's a detective. Listen, Sherlock Holmes, there are seven million people in this town. How do you expect to track down the identity of one unknown lunatic? If you get yourself tangled up in this Lane affair, you might as well hunt yourself a new job, because I need an assistant that works for me. Now, play that on your harmonica. Walter, you're a great man, a magnificent man to head this hospital. But you don't know any more about handling Jimmy Kildare than, than I do. I'm upset myself. I hate to have to do this to a nice young fellow like Lane. In the old days, they used to draw and quarter them, nail up their heads on London Bridge. Today, we're not that merciful. When they kick over the traces, we have to throw them out, and let them die of broken hearts. Mm. Listen, Mr. Gustagerson, you may be a big man in Pittsburgh, but you're no gentleman, you, you, you gorilla. You take a girl out and fill her full of fancy soup and poison champagne, and the next night I can't move a muscle. Oh, I'm all right today. No thanks to you. But from now on, I'm sticking to hamburger and lemonade with a square shooting guy that wouldn't even think of playing a dirty trick on a working girl. Goodbye, rat. Emergency. No, I haven't seen Dr. Kildare for an hour. He went out of here in his street clothes, said he was off for the day. Sure, if I see him, I'll tell him. Sullivan's Cafe. No, Sally, Dr. Kildare is not here, but we're expecting him immediately. Sure, I'll give him your message. Uh, uh, hello, hello. Sally, Sally, here's the doctor. Here's the doctor. I... Hey, Mike, did Joe Wayman or Foghorn come back yet? No, my friend. It was no easy task you gave them. Finding out about this mysterious crazy man is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Oh, don't I know it. His clothes are just stock garments sold by the thousands. The locksmith you left the key with says it's from any one of a million doors in New York. That is, if it's not from Chicago or Boston. That's what I was afraid of. Mother! <laughs> Mother! Goodness sake, what are you doing here? Is something wrong? Where's Father? I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. Your father has to bring a patient to see Dr. Gillespie. Well, well, Mrs. Kildare, you're looking young enough to be your own daughter. Only then you'd be your own mother. <laughs> and you don't look old enough for that. I bet you tell that to all the girls. I do, and I tell them all to make themselves at home. Thanks, Mike. My, my. Things must be pretty slack with you big city doctors. Oh, I don't know. Tell me, are you well and happy? <sighs> Why shouldn't I be both? Well, if you'd simply said yes, I'd have known you were, but uh, what's the trouble? Well, Mother, I think you are a mind reader. Yes, I... I am at kind of a crossroads. Nobody ever accomplished anything without passing crossroads. The only question is, which road do you take? Well, it's not as simple as all that. Doing right is always simple. It's only the wrong thing that takes working out. Oh, excuse me, Doc. Oh, hello, boys. Did you, uh... Oh, Mother, allow me to present Mr. Joe Wayman and uh, Mr. Foghorn Murphy. Foghorn? What's your real name? Harold. I prefer Foghorn. So do I. How do you do, Joe? Awfully glad to see you. I've heard a lot about you and your monkey wrench. Oh, those stories are exaggerated, Mrs. Kildare. I never even owned a monkey wrench. Mm. Well, sit down, fellas. Tell me, did you find out anything? The boy's been getting some information for me. Oh, about those crossroads? Mm. Me and my pals made a house-to-house -house canvas of the neighborhood where your screwball was run over. We found one house where a guy had disappeared. Oh, go on. This mug disappeared in 1911 with a blonde in the Sunday school collection. Here, here, here. I was a blonde myself at 16, and no peroxide either. And the prettiest one in town, I'll bet. The prettiest one in the state, Harold. J. Harold. J. Harold. Oh, excuse me. I won't say another word. I dug up that truck driver that clipped your guy. At first, he wouldn't talk. Then he, uh, he changed his mind. But he don't know who the guy is or anything about him. Oh, oh, who put that thing in my pocket? I... Why am I always someplace else when there's a good fight? Let me know next time you're in town. I'll sock someone for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Doc, I'm sorry we weren't much help. It was kind of tough without knowing the guy's name or anything. Oh, that's all right, fellas. Thanks a lot, anyway. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Kildare. It was swell meeting you. Oh, uh, and if you ever need a taxi, well, just call and... Oh, Nick's on that, Foghorn. I'll take Mrs. Kildare in the ambulance if she has to go anywhere. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll accept both invitations, providing you let me drive. <laughs> That's a day. <laughs> well, now you are stuck, aren't you, son? 
Yes, Mother. I'm afraid now I am in trouble. There's one way out, but it's awfully dangerous. Excuse me. I'm awfully sorry the boys couldn't help. But always remember one thing, Dr. Kildare. Trouble is nothing new for the likes of you and me. The Irish ain't been out of trouble for 1,100 years. Thanks, boy. You said something about uh, dangerous, Jimmy. Dangerous to do what? Well, to cure an insane man before Friday. So they're curing insane people now, are they? Mm. It's an almost fantastic thing called the insulin shock cure. It's a gamble. There's only two things to think about in a gamble. What have you got to win? What have you got to lose? Lose? Everything. My job, another doctor's career, maybe the patient's life. But think of what you've got to win, too. Oh, I'm not thinking about you and the other doctor, but the poor man. You can give him a new life and everything God meant people to enjoy. You're slow to decide, son, because you think you're all alone in this. But you're not. There's a man over in that hospital that's as fine a doctor as ever helped the ailing. Oh, I know, but I can't ask Dr. Gillespie to help me. Who's talking about Dr. Gillespie? I mean your own father. Oh, of course. Well, now the only thing to figure out is how to get a hold of him without Dr. Gillespie suspecting. Get to work, son. I will. Uh, I'll be seeing you, pal. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's funny, Mother. Whenever I know that I'm right with you, I can generally manage to work out everything else. Joyner? Joyner? Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder if you'd do a favor for me. It's awfully important. Precisely 6.30, I'm leaving here to meet a young female person whose boyfriend is confined to room 714 with a broken leg. Until then, I'm going to lie quietly and conserve my manly figure. Oh, you're going to make a phone call for me, and then you're going to take a walk for about half an hour. And furthermore, the young female person has bright yellow hair and practically no brains. Dr. Joyner, if the young lady is free for the evening because her boyfriend has been uh, forbidden visitors, by your orders, of course, I could easily report that... Oh, no, uh, don't shoot. Who do you want me to phone? Gillespie's waiting room. Oh, Dr. Stephen Kildare. Just a minute, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, I understand. Well, just as soon as I finish here. Pardon me, that, uh, that is my wife. Oh. You see, uh, the rash hangs on in spite of everything that I've done, although it's confined to our hands. Well, it's obviously a skin allergy. Allergy? Yeah. Why, that might take months to identify. Tell me, Mrs. Cray, what do you do with yourself? Uh, how do you spend your time? I don't do anything. As long as I get my check for my son, keep the frost off my petunias, and play a little mahjong in the evening. Mahjong? <laughs> mahjong? I've heard of trouble with mahjong sets. The lacquer contains sap from a Japanese tree of the Schumach family. That could account for the skin disease. I could believe anything about that mahjong set. My daughter-in-law sent it to me. Uh, Julia, you didn't take it with you to the Yellowstone last summer, did you? I did not. You can't play mahjong on horseback. You see, when she came back, her hands were all cleared up. Well, there you are, Dr. Stephen. You got it. Suppose we keep Mrs. Cray here for a couple of days and fix up this rash, and then when you go home, take up solitaire. In the meantime, we'll put her across the hall in that nice big room, 370. Oh, Dr. Gillespie, Which we... the rich Mrs. Van Alister has already paid for and two shoes. I sent her home this morning. <laughs> Nothing wrong with her but too much money. <laughs> Goodbye, Dr. Gillespie, and thank you. As long as Dr. Stephen did all the work, I don't owe you a cent. Goodbye. <laughs> Sit down. Well, uh... I'm ever so much obliged to you, Dr. Gillespie. I, uh, well, I've got to run along now. I'll, uh, I'll be back. Mm -hmm. Next patient. No, no, hold the next patient. Come in. Say, Parker, did you notice that I said anything to offend Dr. Stephen? Or was it my imagination that he was acting strangely? I wouldn't know anything about that, but if it was his wife on the phone, he's married to a woman with a bass voice. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, hello, Dad. What is all this? Please sit down. Why all the mystery? Is anything wrong? 
Dad, what do you know about the insulin shock cure for insanity? Insulin shock? Why? Well, tell me, have you ever actually seen a cure affected? Yes, I have. It was one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen in all my life. Ah, but it worked, didn't it? Yes. Yes, it worked because it was, it was performed under the most ideal circumstances, with cases that had every chance of surviving. Well, then you've never seen insulin tried when the patient wasn't in perfect physical shape. Oh, no. No, in case of any injury, especially to the head or the brain, they wouldn't dare. But, Jimmy, stop dodging the issue. If you need any help, I'm your father. I'm sorry. This is my problem. I know it is, Jimmy. And I don't want to interfere. I'll tell you how you can help me. I've read everything about insulin shock. I know all the theories. But I want you to tell me everything you saw. Don't leave out one detail right from the beginning. Well, Jimmy, insulin shock causes the patient to revert backwards through every stage of evolution. At the dictates of his shocked brain, his human body attempts to simulate all the actions and mannerisms of each successive step. Back through the ape, the bird, lizard, fish, and so forth. This abnormal effort involves the most, oh, the most horrible convulsion. Nice work, Mary. Well, it was easy enough to switch places with Irene. She was dying to get the night off. Look, Jimmy, I haven't said a word about this to anyone. You know I wouldn't. But are you sure you want to do this? No, we've been all through that before. No, we haven't. Are you doing this because of Gregory Lane? None of this is Lane's fault. Nothing more than that? Mary, there's a man in there. And if his particular problem isn't solved by tomorrow, he stands a good chance of being a miserable object the rest of his life. Tomorrow's Friday, and I have to find out what that means to him before it's too late. Here we go. I don't know a thing about this insulin business. Well, I know that a terrific shock will sometimes drive a person crazy. An overdose of insulin apparently works just the reverse. Tremendous shock it gives seems to drive the crazed brain back to sanity. Suppose he dies. Let's try supposing he'll live. But what about you if, if he does die? Get his arm ready. be able to tell. Uh, if I'm right, his actions ought to tell us. See, the, the theory is that buried deep in the human brain is the primitive brain of our earliest ancestors. Now, the action of the insulin on that basic part must be what restores the patient's sanity. Because what actually happens, no one knows. Here it comes, Mary. It's working. You see? Brain is starting to travel backwards. Body is compelled to follow. are beginning the first primitive movements. It's as an ape might cling to a tree. Oh, 
instructions are a necessary part of the process. The body is desperately trying to obey the impossible commands of the brain. You see, all the thousands of years of human evolution, the progress of frantically fighting, the muscles must obey. The brain is saying you're no longer a man, you're an animal. <laughs> Dr. Kildare. What do you want? There's been a change of nurses in this case without my knowledge or permission. I did that. Dr. Kildare, what you're doing with this patient is between you and your conscience. Or between you and Dr. Carew, which might be worse. Molly, please. So personally, I think you were born to be hanged. Do you think she'll tell anybody? Look out the pillow. Watch your head. Jimmy, how long do these convulsions keep up? They get less. They may grow worse. We won't know until the fourth hour. Ready? Glucose. Yes. Temperature. This can't be right. 86. No, nobody can live at that temperature. 86. It seems impossible, but it's true. These cases can survive temperatures that otherwise would mean certain death. Flexes sluggish. Ready with the glucose. Give me the tube, quickly. His brain is completely released. If we let him stay too long, we'll never get him out of it. Absorb the glucose. If the insulin's burned out every bit of sugar in his body. The glucose will restore it. Well, the miracle of insulin shock is that one minute you have this, and the next minute, if you're lucky, you have a sane and normal person. But, but if he doesn't come out of it, then we'll have killed him. Can you hear me? How are you? How do you feel? Oh, if I only knew his name. Listen, it's Friday. Jimmy, he's dead. Quiet. Can you hear me? How are you? 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 He's all right, I guess. Milk and jelly sandwiches right away, please. Jelly sandwiches? Jelly sandwiches and milk, nothing else, right away. Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. Hey. Hey. Feel more like yourself now? Fine. Head hurts a little. Well, under the circumstances, that's hardly surprising. You remember me, don't you? Yes, you. Yeah. You're the doctor that wanted to operate on me after I was hurt. That's right. You feel able to answer a few questions? Mm-hmm. Jelly sandwiches. Jelly sandwiches. 
Do you want the jelly inside the sandwiches, or do you want it on the outside? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not in this crazy place. I make coffee for the king. He raises my salary. I make coffee for the general. He kisses me on both cheeks. I make coffee for Molly Bird. She sends it for my relatives. Take them away. He's fine now, Mary. Just give him that food and don't let anyone talk to him until I get back. Back? Where are you going? I've got the answer to this whole business. The thing that was locked up in his poor, twisted brain. Now, listen, Mary. There's no time to explain now. But remember one thing. No one's to see him, and no one's to talk to him. Because if anyone questions him before I get back, it's liable to ruin everything. Do you understand that? Yes, Doctor. Good evening, Alice. Miss, uh, Miss Lamont, isn't it? I want to examine your patient. Well, uh... Oh, the hour may be a bit unusual, but this is a very unusual case. Uh, and, uh, while I'm in there, you might get me a little bicarbonate of soda. I've, uh, I've just come from a doctor's banquet. Oh, Dr. Carew, the patient mustn't be disturbed. Indeed? Who said so? Doctor... Dr. Hepworth, the staff physician on the case. Oh, that's all right. I spoke to Hepworth at 7 o'clock and told him I was coming in. Yes, but, um, he came back after that. But Hepworth told me he wasn't coming back until morning. What is this? I just left Hepworth at the banquet. Oh, it must have been some other doctor. What other doctor? Well, I don't know his name. It's quite obvious something untoward is going on here. I intend to find out for myself. Well, 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 well. Wait outside, Carnival. Yes, sir. Why, Walter, you look positively beautiful. This is not the time or place for jokes, Leonard. Well, you must have been joking just now when I came in, wasn't he, Mary? Uh, Leonard, in order to testify properly before the hospital board, I must have complete knowledge of this patient's condition. Well, that's not unreasonable, Mary. But, Dr. Gillespie, the patient mustn't be disturbed. It couldn't be that Dr. Kildare told you not to let anybody in, could it? I don't know a thing, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. I'd better go in and find out. No, no, wait a minute. Come on, Mary, you might as well tell us. Otherwise, Dr. Carew will have the right to go in there. That's just what Jimmy wants to avoid, isn't it? Dr. Kildare administered insulin shock. I, I can't believe it. And he did a magnificent job of it. I'll believe that when I examine the patient. Ah, Walter, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. I know I wouldn't. And I was practicing medicine when they were telling you to keep your thumb out of your mouth. Where is Jimmy? I don't know. This is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard. Oh, you ain't heard nothing yet. Well, what's the last thing Kildare said? Give him the jelly sandwiches and don't let anyone near him until I get back. Jelly sandwiches? Of course, jelly sandwiches. You're a doctor, remember? In spite of that outfit. Jelly sandwiches are exactly the right thing to increase the sugar content. Oh, yes, yes, of course, jelly sandwiches. Oh, make it peanut butter if you want, only let's get on with it. What else, Mary? That's all I know, except the patient in there is as sane as you are. Me or Carew? Dr. Kildare. Dr. Kildare, you're suspended from further duty and just... Just one moment. Nurse, has anyone been in that room? Not a living soul, Doctor. And you're not going in till I know all about this? No, I know, but... Mrs. Adams is. She has a legal right to see her husband. Will you come in now, please? And everything's going to be all right, if you'll just remember. Oh, my dear. I've come back, Henry. Back to stay. If you're going to stay, everything will be all right now. Now, Kildare, just to satisfy the curiosity of a senile old man, I'll make it two senile old men. That'll take you in, Walter. Of course, the treatments will have to be continued. Adams has been a mental case for months, the result of a separation from his wife. Oh, you don't have to hit me over the head with a bottle. I know the rest of it, too. Yes, it seems his wife had sent him a letter suggesting a reconciliation. And Friday was the day they were to meet. Walter, it wouldn't surprise me if you could see through the holes in a ten-foot ladder. Jimmy, how long did he wait for her to come back? About five years, Mary. 
Well, at least I think it's been established that Dr. Lane's operation did not cause schizophrenia. Or do I have to hit you over the head with a bottle? What can I say? I've been wrong. Sometimes I wish that anybody but me was running this hospital. Walter, in the boss's job, even when you're right, you're wrong. Thanks, Leonard. Regardless of the hour, I shall go immediately to Dr. Lane and offer him my personal and professional apologies, which will make me very happy. Well, that's fine, because Dr. Kildare's working for you, beginning tomorrow morning. Working for me? Yes, Kildare, I warned you. You're no longer my assistant. You're fired. Oh, come on, Walter. This has been a nice little case. But there are a million people in New York that need doctors. Perhaps if we get a little sleep, we can help them. Yes, but, Leonard, half the time, I don't know whose side you're on. Well, three quarters of the time, I don't know myself. Jimmy, did you hear what he said? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, let's not talk about it now. But all your plans, all you'd hope to do. Say, I have half a notion to go up and give that rambunctious old fossil a piece of my mind. Keep your shirt on, Mary. Oh, you men make me tired. What is it, Jimmy? You asked me how long he waited for her? Yes, five years. Well, Mary, the reason I've never said anything to you about anything is because I didn't think it fair to even ask you if you'd be willing to wait as long as we'd have to wait. Perhaps I'm going too fast. There's good-looking guy in this hospital named Gregory Lane who's in fine favor with the powers that be and has a lot of money. Well, maybe we can find a nice girl to introduce him to. Oh, and I presume we're engaged to be married. Jimmy, I saw the look on Mrs. Adams' face and five years are going to be just nothing. Well, then will you wait just five minutes? I'll be right back. Well, now where are you going? I'm going to give that rambunctious old fossil a piece of my mind. Hold everything. I suppose you thought I was going to take that crack of yours lying down. Nine goes on the ten. And isn't it nice to be alone? Well, I want to tell you something. You can't fire me because I won't be fired. And if you do fire me, I won't stay fired. Oh, the Lone Ranger, huh? I owe silver. <sighs> you make me feel like a fool. Well, you said you were going to make a fool of yourself, didn't you? Well, who was it said you have to have an instinct for diagnosis and the courage to follow it up? I did. Well, every instinct I had told me that Dr. Lane was a good surgeon. Why, you little pipsqueak. If it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't have got to first base. You? Yes, sir. Who was it that had you notify that you were behind in surgery? Mahatma Gandhi? Who was it had you assigned to Dr. Lane? Little Red Riding Hood, who gave Dr. Hepworth the tickets to that banquet? Santa Claus? No, lame brain. Even you couldn't have gotten away with that insolent business without my full authority back of you all the time. Of course, Molly Bird helped a bit. And she made me drink two quarts of milk. Yeah. You're still fired. Why? Well, because you're not always going to be lucky. Someday, some of those fantastic crusades of yours are going to kick back on you and crucify you. And then what'll be the good... Thank you. And then what'll be the use of my teaching my job to a man who's going to end up by having his head nailed on London Bridge? Funny, you never think of that once you get started. Young Dr. Kildare, you've got a single-track mind. I'm trying to be like you. There's only one man in the world like me. Me. Well, I wish you'd act more like it sometimes. Boy, I haven't made a mistake since 1926. Except you. Now, what about Dr. Lockberg? Well, what about Dr. Lockberg? I saw him last night, 5 o'clock. You made the appointment. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting him examine you, you spent the entire time teaching him to play double solitaire and smoking cigarettes. Well, Jimmy... Suppose I promise you to see Lockburg three times a week and you can stay in the room. Eh? That is, provided you'll promise not to make a fool of yourself more than three times a year. Why do you think I came up here? What do you think I've been waiting up here, all dressed up in tight pants? With... Jimmy, for the love of Pete, give me a cigarette, will you? Well... You 
guess there's only one thing left to do now, and that's tell Dr. Lane about Adams. Uh, I'll go do that now. Oh, no, 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 no. That'll keep until tomorrow. Oh, no, it won't either. Lane's waiting in his room. I telephoned him when I left for Mrs. Adams. Well, I'll go along with you. Well, I think you better know. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Carnival? Carnival. Where is that sleepy rascal? Well, I'll give you a hand. Unless you'd rather not. No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Jimmy. Of course. As long as I know you're back there, I know you're not in any mischief. Oh, I could see the whole thing coming. The trouble with you is, Jimmy, you got one of those honest faces. A man can look at you and almost tell exactly what you're thinking. Well, I'm different. Poker face Gillespie, they call me. Know everything and show nothing. That's me. It's like a sixth sense. I can tell exactly what's going on all the time, behind my back or through a stone wall. For instance, at this moment, Jimmy, you're wishing you could shake me and join that Lamont girl. Isn't that what you're thinking? Isn't that what you're thinking? Answer me! No, boss, it ain't. 